You've probably seen something like this before. Okay. So, if we look at the Cauchy stress and we apply this tensor transformation to it, so basically just using that equation, T prime equals R T R transpose, right? So I'm just going to apply that. Now I'm going to replace T with the Cauchy stress, right? Okay. So R, the stress prime, R stress R T, right? And if we choose this R in a special way, okay, we'll talk about what that special way is, but if we if we choose it in a special way, we can get a sigma prime that is diagonal. And so the diagonal entries of this guy, and we're going to use the convention, we're always going to order this in a way that sigma 1 is greater than sigma 2 is greater than sigma 3. Okay. And so if I choose R in a way, a special way, then I can get this diagonal matrix like this, okay? So who knows how to choose that special R, R or what it should look like? Has anyone ever seen maybe like a spectral decomposition where you can take a matrix A and you can decompose it into its eigenvectors times a matrix of its eigenvalues times its eigenvectors transpose, right? So if you and if you do this, if you do this decomposition, uh, rather it's not equal to, but if you decompose A in this way, then then what you'll get is a diagonal matrix, right? This is like a spectral decomposition. You have to have seen this, right? shows up in linear algebra and other places, okay? So basically what we want to do in order to diagonalize this thing is we want to solve the eigenvalue problem, right, for the, the, the tensor sigma, okay? So what's, who knows what, how you solve an eigen, for eigenvalues of a matrix? Come on. I think you're just being quiet. You have to know. Right? Well, as soon as I write it down, you're sh matrix times Well, that's sort of what I wrote here. But we don't know what the eigenvectors are yet, so we have to, we have to solve that problem, right? So the, 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 it's the solution. The eigenvalues are the solution to this equation, right? Right? Look familiar now? So we have this matrix sigma minus lambda times the identity matrix. And we take the determinant of that thing and set it equal to zero. And the roots, the values of lambda, are the eigenvalues. Okay? And then the eigenvectors are the vectors associated with the null space of those eigenvalues. Okay? Now, I've sort of in my notes, of maybe I shouldn't have, if you guys really don't know this, maybe I can come back and do it next time the long way. I mean, it's sort of a lot of algebra. It's not hard algebra, it's just a bunch of algebra, so I kind of skipped it, okay? But, but if you feel like you need it, you can come by my office or maybe I'll add it to the next lecture, okay? But so if you work this out, what you'll get is a characteristic equation that looks like this. Okay, and these i's are called the invariants. So again, if I if I work this determinant of sigma minus lambda i, set it equal to zero, I get this. Now, of course, the i's are big long coefficients, 
right? But it, but nevertheless, you know, if you combine them up, then then there's so the so-called invariance, and in this case, I'm going to say invariance of the stress tensor. But it turns out, you know, every matrix has invariance. A second-order tensor or, or a three by three matrix will always have three invariants. Okay, and so these invariants are kind of neat because. They're, I mean, the reason they're called invariants is because they're invariant to a rotation. They don't change, okay? So if I, and I have a demonstration later, I'll show you, but, you know, remember what the stress is. It's, it's sort of, you know, it's defined by the traction vector in the normal, right? And the normal is defined by a plane. So if I have a body and I cut it through a plane, and I, and I can find the stress tensor at that point where the normal vector crosses through with some traction, right? Well, if I rotate that pr plane, the stress is going to change, right? The, the, the entries in the matrix are going to change, okay? Depending on how I rotate that plane. And, I, and I'll have an a little demonstration later, right? But the invariance won't, right? So the, the entries will change, but the invariance won't. And so these are nice things to later on, maybe we can build constitutive models from them. Like constitutive models are things that relate stress to strain. Because it's nice, I mean, you want your constitutive model to be the same invariant of a rotation, right? You wouldn't want to have to define, think about a body, and you have some known relationship between stress and strain, and then you t rotate it a little bit, and you have to come up with a whole new one, right? That would be very bad, because it means You'd have to go to the lab and rotate the body in you know, every direction that you could possibly rotate it, constantly doing tests to develop a constitutive model, right? <clears throat> so you know, again, I'm skipping the algebra, but <clears throat> if we work out what these invariants are, the first invariant is actually the trace of the stress tensor, which we also might write as sigma ii. Okay, so that's sigma, in terms of the principal stresses, that's sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3, right? Because in, in terms of the, of the principal stresses, obviously the trace, there's, there's no, you know, you just sum up the, the entry thing. Okay. <clears throat> Sometimes you also might see that this is 3 times P, where P is the hydrostatic pressure. So this is not, you know, later we're going to learn about, where we're going to, you know, in about two weeks maybe, we're going to talk about poor elasticity. And then you also have a subsequent poor pressure. But here we're just talking about the hydrostatic pressure on the, on the material, on the solid material. Okay. So the second invariant is one-half sigma ij, sigma ij, minus one half I one squared, right? And so in terms of the principal stresses, that's sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, sigma three, sigma two, sigma three. Okay. So again, the summation is applied here. So we're summing over the first in index and then summing over the second index, right? So there's two repeated indices. We're going to sum over the i's and sum over the j's. <clears throat> okay. And the third invariant is just the determinant of the stress tensor. And of course, in terms of the principal stresses, you know, the determinant, it's the determinant of any matrix is the product of its eigenvalues. That's an identity, right? And if you have a matrix that looks like this, that's only diagonal, that, those are the eigenvalues. And in fact, we know they're the eigenvalues because that's how we solved for them, right? So th the determinant of this matrix is the product of the eigenvalues. Well, it's just the product of the diagonal. You know, so sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. OK? So <clears throat> we also can de decompose the stress tensor into something we call the 
the spherical or hydrostatic or sometimes the dilatational stress. So those are all three names that you might see. Plus the deviatoric. So this type of decomposition is very common when we talk about plasticity or, or inelasticity, right? So this is when you permanently deform a material. So in your undergraduate class, you know, every material you ever studied, in your undergraduate solid mechanics, every material you ever studied had a stress-strain curve that looked like this, right? Well, it turns out that most materials actually don't, you know, they, if you continue to strain them, particularly for a metal, you're going to get plasticity, right? Such that this, this part of the stress, or strain rather, is permanent. So if you unload it, you're going to end up with a permanent amount of strain. Okay? Who thinks rocks, who thinks rocks are plastic materials? Are they elastic or do they actually exhibit plasticity? Yeah, they do, especially under confinement, right? In an unconfined setting, typically not. Like if you just put a rock in a <coughs> standard test frame and compress it, it'll be linear elastic and then it'll fail. But if you, excuse me, <coughs> if you hydrostatically confine it and load it, it can exhibit a tremendous amount of plas plasticity. I use the word plasticity in quotes because plasticity in metals is associated with slip, and you know it's not a it's typically not a slip mechanism. Although it can be some slip of microcracks, typically in rocks it's due to pore collapse and other things, right? But in rocks you can have very very complex constitutive responses, and we'll talk about some of that later. So going back to this decomposition, it turns out that it's very important in plasticity modeling um, because, you know, particularly for metals, the plasticity in metals is, is irrespective of any hydrostatic compression. So what I mean there is you can, you can take a metal and you can compress it to very, very high, you know, hydrostatically, so just squeeze it on all sides, if you will, to very, very, very high pressures. And when you let it go, it'll return to its original configuration, okay? So the plasticity that occurs is due to the deviatoric response. And so when we work with plasticity models, a lot of times we only work with the deviatoric component. Right? This is particularly true uh, for metals, um, and that's where we'll start, because they're the simplest. Uh, but then later on, we'll also learn, you know, for rocks and other things, then we, we need a hydrostatic component too. Okay, and so uh, this deviatoric stress has its own uh, invariance, and we, we typically use J, so J1 is equal to zero. And that's because the deviatoric stress is a traceless tensor, right? So I take, the, to find the deviatoric stress, I take the full stress and I subtract the spherical, right? Yeah. Um, I wrote right here. Maybe I'll do this. So, you know, the um, the deviatoric stress is is only is the full stress minus the hydrostatic stress, right? And so, the hydrostatic stress, right, in, includes this term that's the trace, the, the sigma kk, right? So it turns out that the deviatoric stress is traceless. And then if you compute, so if you compute the first invariant, which is the sum of the which is the sum of the diagonals, it's going to be zero, right? Because you subtracted it off to begin with when you defined it, right? Okay, so then J2 is equal to, it's the same, one-half SIJ SIJ 
So it's the same as this. It's just remember I1 or J1 is zero. So all you're left with is this term. Okay, for J. And then J3 is equal to the determinant of S. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I wrote real small here. I didn't want to go. The next page is sort of a total di different topic, so I wanted to keep it all on this on this page. Okay. So these are just some properties, and uh, later on, you know, we'll, we'll return to these uh, and, and do some useful things with them.